Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for a Tax Practitioners Board webinar. My name is Julie Shaw, and I'll be hosting today's session. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Tax Practitioners Board acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and the connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past, present and future. We extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Now today's webinar has been created to connect directly with you, the tax practitioner community. We value your opinion and today is an opportunity to raise any questions that you may have directly with us. Now following today's uh, presentation, we will be providing you with a copy of today's presentation slides and we'll send these to you via the email address that you use to register for today's session. You can also access the slides now by visiting our website and going to the, we the webinar resources hub and that's located at tpb.gov.au forward slash webinar dash hub. And I'd also like to remind you that today's webinar will count towards your CPE and you can claim one hour for attending. However, I do um, note here that we do not issue attendance certificates. So let's have a look at what we're going to be covering today. So in today's webinar, we'll be discussing what it means to take reasonable care to verify your client's state of affairs and to apply the law correctly. So what we'll look at is what reasonable care means. We'll look at your obligations under the Code of Professional Conduct. We'll look at the level of reasonable care required. We'll also have a look at examples of how to help you exercise your professional judgment and the consequences for failing to comply with your obligations. We'll also go over some real life case studies to help um, make your obligations clearer as well. Then to finish up, we'll answer some of the common questions that we received during the webinar today. So please put those through in the chat there. And um, in that regard, we have two of our policy advisors online with us today. That's Madeline Savos and uh, Jasminda Ray. So they'll be on hand today to respond to your questions as we go. So as I've said, just put those through in the chat box there. So just before we do begin today, I'd like to introduce our speaker. We have TPB board member Craig Stevens. So welcome, Craig. It's great to have you on board with us today. And I'll hand over to you now to kick off the presentation. Thanks, Julie. Thanks for having me this morning. And good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here presenting. Today's topic is an important one. Taking reasonable care is a significant element of the Code of Professional Conduct. And although there's no set formula for determining what it means to take reasonable care in any given situation, our plan today is to help you determine what steps to take. As Julie said, we'll go through some examples to help you exercise your professional judgment and to get a better understanding of the practical elements of reasonable care. So let's begin by talking about your reasonable care obligations and what we mean by reasonable care. Your obligations as a registered tax agent or BAS agent regarding reasonable care are set out in the Tax Agent Services Act of 2009, or TASA for short, within the Code of Professional Conduct, commonly referred to as the Code. As a registered tax practitioner, you should be familiar with 14 items in the Code, which, code which we've listed on the slide. The Code's 14 items are grouped under five key principles, which include honesty and integrity, independence, confidentiality, competence, and other responsibilities. Specifically, your reasonable care obligations fall under code items nine and 10. So before we look at these code items in more detail, let's first explore what we mean by the term reasonable care. So the duty to take reasonable care is a well-established feature of the common law in Australia. While the code does not extend the common law duty of registered tax practitioners to take reasonable care, it does establish an additional range of possible statutory consequences under the TASA. The standard of reasonable care generally required of a registered tax practitioner is that of a competent and reasonable person possessing the knowledge, skills, qualifications and experience a registered tax practitioner is expected to have. As I mentioned earlier, there's no set formula for determining what it means to take reasonable care in any given situation. Whether a registered tax practitioner has taken reasonable care will depend on an examination of all the circumstances and his or, his or her exercising of their professional judgment 
to consider factors like the terms of engagement between the tax practitioner and client, the complexity of the transaction and the tax practitioner's expertise, the client's circumstances, including their level of sophistication, such as their level of knowledge in the particular subject area, and the nature of any pre-existing relationship between the tax practitioner and client. The Accounting Professional and Ethical Standards Board has stated that professional competence and due care is a fundamental principle that members must comply with. The principle requires a member to maintain professional knowledge and skill at a level required to ensure that a client or employer receives competent professional services and they act diligently in accordance with applicable technical and professional standards. This requires, among other things, the exercise of sound judgment in applying professional knowledge and skill in the performance of such a service. So as we just note, noted, regional care obligations fall under code items nine and 10. So let's look at each of those code items in a bit more detail. Code item nine requires registered tax practitioners to take reasonable care in ascertaining a client's state of affairs to the extent that ascertaining the state of those affairs is relevant to a statement they are making or a thing they are doing on behalf of the client. Code Item 9 doesn't require you to order, examine or review books and records or other source documents to independently verify the accuracy of information supplied by your clients. However, you cannot automatically discharge your responsibility by simply accepting what you have been told by clients. Where a statement provided by a client seems credible, consistent for existing clients, and you have no reason to doubt it, you can accept it without further checking. In these circumstances, you are not just accepting what the client tells you or gives you at face value. Rather, you have exercised your professional judgment based on the information previously provided by the client and the nature of the client themselves and have made a decision that further checking is not required in the specific circumstances. On the other hand, if the information supplied by a client doesn't seem credible or appears to be inconsistent with previous claims or statements, or other information you know about the client, you would need to make further inquiries. In cases where the information provided by your client doesn't seem to add up, taking reasonable care means you ask questions of your client or examine the client's records, or both. In certain situations, it's good practice to make further inquiries to ascertain your client's current state of affairs. Examples include when there are new or substantial changes in the law, or you take on a new or inexperienced client, or you notice unusual transactions in the context of the regular business of your client. So maybe now would be a good time to look at an example that touches on some of these points. All right, so this example goes to the heart of the issue around doing a little bit more work when information provided is seemingly not credible. This example relates very closely to many real life situations we see in the black economy. In this scenario, we have Mitch who engages Tia, a registered tax agent, to prepare and lodge his income tax return for his tiling business. Mitch is a new client that has asked Tia to prepare his income tax return for the year. He's a sole trader who's under the GST registration threshold and has no employees. Mitch provides some information that indicates his turnover the year was turnover for the year was $35,000 and his expenses were $25,000. Mitch has been running his tiling business for four years now and says he's kept pretty busy throughout the year. After consulting the ATO small business benchmarks, Tia notices that Mitch's turnover of $35,000 appears to be low and that his business expenses as a proportion of his turnover are high for the industry that he works in. Tia explains to Mitch that the ATO small business benchmarks show ranges of business expenses to business turnover that can be used to compare his business to similar businesses in the tolling services industry. Should Tia lodge the income tax return as instructed, it is likely that Mitch would come to the attention of the ATO who will seek additional information to substantiate his income and expenses. 
So TIA requests information on how Mitch records cash sales. Mitch admits he needs to improve his record keeping. Sometimes he keeps notes of what he was paid after a job, but there have been times when he has been so tired after he finishes his job that he might have forgotten. He also advises that he just uses his personal bank account to deposit the cash and pay expenses. Tia explains that it is important for Mitch to keep better records going forward, forward and advises Mitch that he should consider getting a business bank account that is separate from his personal account. She works with Mitch to estimate his cash income for the year. And after reviewing his bank account records, Mitch also revised the business expenses, removing personal expenses that have been included in error. In this situation, if Tia had not asked further questions in relation to Mitch's income and expenses and didn't review his documents, while knowing the business expenses and income reported fall outside of the small business benchmarks and lodged Mitch's income tax return as instructed, she would have failed to carry out her obligations under Code Item 9 by failing to make additional inquiries in relation to Mitch's comparatively high expenses and low turnover. So I'll share another example with you now to apply what we've just discussed in relation to Code Item 9 and making further inquiries. Mike, the tax agent, was completing an income tax return for his client, Ruby, who operates a coffee shop. He notices that Ruby is seeking to claim the purchase of several board games as a business expense. While Ruby has receipts to substantiate the claims, Mike is concerned that given Ruby runs a coffee shop, she may be trying to inappropriately claim the board games purchased for her personal use. Mike contacts Ruby to raise his concerns and requests that Ruby confirms by email how the purchase is related to running a coffee shop. She advises by email that the coffee shop runs a game site twice a week and the purchase of the board games was in fact for that purpose, not for personal use. As such, Mike lodges Ruby's income tax return, including the deduction for the purchased board games. So in this scenario, Mike took reasonable steps to ensure that the claims made in the income tax return for his client were correct. So now let's take a look at a BAS agent example. Adele, a BAS agent, is engaged by a new client, Manny, to prepare and lodge the quarterly BAS. Manny has been referred to Adele by a tax agent, and when preparing the BAS, Adele notices that certain transactions appear to be abnormal for the industry that Manny works in. When questioned, about the transaction, Manny is vague and does not provide sufficient clarity to satisfy Adele that the transactions have been appropriately recorded and relate to his business. As such, Adele raises her concerns with the referring tax agent. The tax agent tells her to include the transactions with a note for the tax agent to look at the, them more closely at the end of the reporting period. Adele follows the tax agent's instructions. In this circumstance, Adele has discharged her obligations by raising the concerns with the tax agent and making a note for the tax agent to review the transactions in question at the end of the reporting period. The tax agent then must also ensure that they take reasonable care in ascertaining the client's state of affairs when reviewing those transactions. Hey, the next example I want to go through looks at asking questions about changes to a client's circumstances. In this example, we have a tax agent, Stefano, was preparing an income tax return for a client, Pam, who had engaged him for the previous five years. In the past three years, Pam has been single and had not reported her having a spouse in her income tax return. While preparing Pam's tax return, Stefano did not make any inquiries of Pam in relation to if any of her personal circumstances had changed, including whether or not she had a spouse. As a result, Stefano incorrectly reported that Pam did not have a spouse in her tax return which affected her eligibility to receive a rebate for private health insurance. In this case, Stefano failed to take reasonable care to ascertain his client's state of affairs relevant to the preparation of her income tax return. The final example I'd like to go cover for Code 9 involves a tax agent who has suspicions about claims being made by her client. Daisy completes an income tax return for her client, Parker, Parker started a new job working as a delivery driver for a local business, using his personal car to make deliveries. He was referred to Daisy as 
she prepares income tax returns for a number of workers at the same business. When reviewing Parker's logbook, Daisy noticed that the figures in that logbook were identical to another two clients who worked in the same business. As it was tax time, Daisy's practice was very busy, so she decided to accept all the information from Parker at face value and proceeded to lodge his income tax return. In this example, Daisy has failed to carry out her obligations under Code Item 9 by failing to make additional inquiries in order to be satisfied that the claim is being made on behalf of Parker are correct. To have met the obligations of Code Item 9, Daisy should have requested additional substantiating documentation and information in order to be satisfied that the claims being made were correct. In this case, examples of additional evidence she could request include delivery schedules or diary to confirm Parker's delivery jobs, including the location of deliveries, petrol and servicing receipts, odometer readings using either the logbook method or the census per kilometre method. Daisy should also advise Parker of proper record keeping of expenses that he may want to claim in deductions. All right, I'll hand back to Julie now to conduct a quick poll so that we can put all the information I've just been through into some context. Thanks, Craig. Uh, so this poll that we have for you now is a multiple choice question and it's based on a scenario that you may encounter yourself. So the poll will just pop up on your screen in just a moment and all we ask you to do is select the correct response from the list. So we'll just launch the poll now. Um, and the scenario that we're looking at here is um, Sophia engages Jonah, a registered tax agent, to prepare and lodge her income tax return. Sophia is a regular client of Jonah. Jonah inquires and ascertains that Sophia's personal circumstances have not changed from previous years. So Jonah then simply checks to ensure that the information provided by Sophia is consistent with previous tax returns he has prepared for her. Jonah concludes that the information provided by Sophia is consistent with tax returns from previous years. So the question that we have for you here is, has Jonah complied with his reasonable care obligations under code item nine? And the options that we have for you here are yes, no, and unsure. So please just take a moment to answer the question and we'll come back again in a moment and we'll share the results with you all. Okay, I'm just going to keep that open for a bit longer so that we can get everyone putting through their responses there. And just while you're putting your responses through, I will just mention that we do have a copy of the slides available for you at the moment on the website. If you go to our webinar resources page, um, you can see the slides there. We'll also send you a copy after the presentation today as well. Okay, it looks like we've got quite a few responses coming through there. I'll keep it open for a couple of seconds more. Okay, might just close that one off now. And then we're going to share the results on the screen as well. So they should pop up for you in a second. But while we're waiting for that to happen, I'll just let you know, we've had about 80% of people saying that yes, um, she has complied with her obligation. About 13% say no, and around 6% are saying that they're not quite sure what the, um, the answer is there. So I just want to say thanks everyone for participating in the poll, and I'll hand back to Craig now so that he can discuss the, result, the results with you all. Thanks, Julie. So in this case, yes, to comply with his obligations under Code Item 9, Jonah must take reasonable care to a certain Sophia's state of affairs to the extent it is relevant to preparing and lodging her income tax return. In this case, we say Jonah has satisfied his obligation under Code Item 9 to take reasonable care by exercising his professional knowledge, skills and judgment, and would not be required to undertake any further detailed inquiries. If Sophia was a new client of Jonah's and providing no supporting evidence relating to the information to, to be included in the tax return, then we would expect Jonah would need to make further inquiries to ensure the tax return included all relevant information for Sophia's tax affairs. All right, so we'll move to the other code item which relates to taking reasonable care, which is code item 10. Code item 10 states you must take reasonable care to ensure that taxation laws are applied correctly 
to the circumstances in relation to which you are providing advice to a client. So it's important to note that taking reasonable care to ensure the correct interpretation and application of the law does not necessarily mean an incorrect interpretation and application is an automatic breach of this provision. However, if you applied taxation laws incorrectly because you did not take reasonable care to determine the correct tax treatment in the circumstances, you would likely be in breach of code item 10. Taking reasonable care and applying taxation laws correctly to your client's circumstances may include you referring to legislation and related extrinsic material, e.g. explanatory memoranda to act, relevant case law, rulings and determinations issued by the ATO on the topic in question, commissioners, commissioners instructions in documents such as income tax returns, fast returns, fact sheets and practice statements, any other guidance material published by the ATO, including on its website. Information published or provide, provided by a recognised professional association or other relevant regulatory agency, including the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority. Publications, information, advice or commentaries published by other experts, registered practitioners or specialists. Another registered tax practitioner or a legal practitioner who has the ability and expertise to provide the advice on tax laws and all relevant training material. So let's go through an example of code item 10 now. Acme Corporation engages Sarah, a registered tax agent, to help claim the current research and development tax incentive. Sarah is not familiar with the R&D tax incentive rules. Although she has previously advised on the R&D tax concessions, which were replaced with the R&D tax incentive. She is not a specialist in the area of tax, or this area of tax law and has not updated her knowledge of the rules at this time. To comply with their obligations under code item 10, Sarah must take reasonable care to ensure that taxation laws are applied correctly to the circumstances in relation to which she is providing advice to Acme Corporation. Sarah recognises that she does not have the requisite skills and knowledge to advise Acme Corporation about the R&D tax incentive and seeks assistance from another registered tax agent, Brian, who Sarah knows specialises in R&D. Sarah confirms this arrangement with Acme Corporation. By taking these steps, Sarah has complied with her obligation under code item 10. Now let's take this example one step further and examine what would happen if Sarah decided not to seek assistance from another registered tax agent with the requisite specialist R&D skills and knowledge. If she instead advised Acme Corporation about the R&D tax incentive based on her limited knowledge of the previous rules and without undertaking her own research about the relevant subject matter, she will most likely have breached her obligations under Code Item 10. Okay, I want to share one more example of Code Item 10 before we move on to look at the level of reasonable care required. In this case, Sunshine Solar Proprietary Limited engages Kevin and Green, a large accounting firm and registered tax agent, to provide advice on the tax implications relating to the importation of certain solar panels. Sunshine Solar advises Kevin and Green that it has already received advice from Paul Partners, another registered tax agent, regarding this matter. Sunshine Solar provides Kevin and Green with a copy of the advice from Paul Partners and advises them that it wants a second opinion. To comply with its obligations under Code Item 10, Kevin and Green must take reasonable care to ensure taxation laws are applied correctly to the circumstances in relation to which it is providing advice to Sunshine Solar, the price limited. So they obtain relevant source documentation from Sunshine Solar and undertake the necessary research in relation to the relevant tax laws. Kevin and Green determines that there are two views in relation to the application of the relevant tax laws that considers that the more correct view is the same as that containing the advice from Paul, and part, uh, Paul Partners. Kevin and Green advises Sunshine Solar that its advice is the same as that provided by Paul Partners. So in this case, Kevin and Green has complied with its obligations to take reasonable care. All right, so let's explore now the extent to which reasonable care is required.
So you'll note code item nine does not simply say that you must take reasonable care in a certain in your client's state of affairs. It clarifies this requirement by stating to the extent that ascertaining the state of affairs is relevant to a statement the tax practitioner is making or a thing they are doing on behalf of their client. Similarly, code item 10 says to take reasonable care to ensure that taxation laws are applied correctly to the circumstances in relation to which the tax practitioner is providing advice to a client. So what does that mean you need to do? The requirement to take reasonable care relates to the services you have been engaged to provide for the client. The terms could have been agreed during a conversation, an email, or via an engagement letter. And by the way, the TPB highly recommends the use of engagement letters in setting out the terms of an engagement. Further inquiries would not be needed if the agreed scope of the services either excludes the examination of information provided by the client or requires you to rely on the information or advice of another expert. However, if you identified or reasonably ought to have identified that the information is incorrect or incomplete, you should make further inquiries. So let's look at an example. Let me just move that slide on one. Uh, so let's look at another example now in relation to the extent of reasonable care required. This time we have Bob, a property developer. He engages Lee, a registered tax agent, to provide GST-related tax advice. This includes advising on the application of a margin scheme. Lee specialises in GST-related advisory work, however she does not have an in-depth understanding of the rules relating to the margin scheme. To comply with her obligations under Code Item 10, Lee must take reasonable care to ensure that tax laws are applied correctly to the circumstances in relation to which she is providing advice to Bob. As Lee's experience and knowledge of the rules relating to the margin scheme is limited, she refers to the relevant legislation, case law and publications by the ATO, including the Commissioner's views as expressed in relevant rulings and determinations. It also refers to colleagues and other experts and then applies this research in providing her advice to Bob. In this case, Lee has complied with her obligations under Code Item 10 to take reasonable care to ensure that tax laws are applied correctly by undertaking the necessary research prior, provide, prior to providing her advice. If Lee had relied upon her existing limited knowledge of the margin scheme to advise Bob, she will most likely have breached her obligations under Code Item 10 as she has not taken reasonable care to ensure the correct application of the law to Bob's circumstances. So on that, I'll hand back to Julie to conduct another quick poll. Thanks, Craig. Um, again, this poll is a multiple choice question. And again, it's also based on a scenario that you may encounter. Um, it should pop up on your screen, but I do note that a few people commented they had some issues with the poll popping up last time. Um, so hopefully everything will work correctly this time. So we'll open it up now, but I will open it for a little bit longer than we did last time just to make sure that everyone gets the poll. Um, so this uh, scenario, we have Poppy's Designs, which is Proprietary Limited, and they engage Lynn, a registered tax agent, to prepare the income tax return. Poppy's Design is a new client. They give Lynn all of their tax information, including its ads and GST reconciliation accounts, which have been prepared by Rose, a registered BAS agent. Lynn has previously examined work prepared by Rose for other clients and has not had any concerns as to the quality of Rose's work. Lynn must take reasonable care to ascertain Poppy's design's state of affairs to the extent that the state of those affairs is relevant to the thing Lynn is doing on behalf of Poppy's designs. In this case, uh, the relevant thing is preparing the income tax return. As Rose is re a registered BAS agent and Lynn has no reason to doubt the quality of her work, he accepts her work at base value. Further, Lynn undertakes relevant checks in relation to such tax information provided by Poppy's Designs, which has not been prepared by Rose, to assure himself he has all the relevant information to prepare the income tax return. 
So the question for this um, scenario here is, has Lynn complied with his reasonable care obligations in this situation? And the choices that you have there are yes, no, and unsure. So I'll give everyone some time to put through the answers there and then we'll come back once again and we'll share the results. I'll also just note that if you are um, using a mobile phone or a tablet, you might not get the poll just because of the size of your screen. So there are sometimes issues there around using the poll as well. Okay, it looks like we've got a few responses coming through, but I will keep it open just a little bit longer just to give you some more time. Okay, we might close that off now. And once again, we're just going to share the results on the screen. So you should all be able to see those in a minute. And um, I'll just go through the results that we have here. So um, we've got about 70% of people saying that yes, they do think that Lynn has complied with his reasonable care obligations in this situation. About 20, 21% are saying no, and about 9% are saying that they're unsure in this situation. So thanks again, everyone, for participating in the poll. And um, Craig, I'll hand back over to you now to discuss the results with everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. So in this case, yes, we would say Lynn has satisfied his obligation under Code Item 9 to take reasonable care by exercising his professional knowledge, skills and judgment to determine that he can accept the tax information prepared by Rose at face value in the circumstances. Undertaking relevant checks in relation to such tax information provided by property designs which has not been prepared by Rose to ensure himself that he has all the relevant information to prepare property designs income tax return. If Lynn had had doubts as to the quality of Rose's work, for example, doubts arising from previous interactions with her as bookkeeper, it would not be reasonable for him to accept her work at face value. In these circumstances, Lynn could demonstrate he exercised reasonable care in various ways. These might include seeking further instructions from his client to review the original documentation, for example, going back to tax invoices, or to satisfy himself of the procedure and methodology Rose used to arrive at a particular determination. Right, so now that we've learned about your reasonable care obligations and ways to ensure you are meeting them, I'll talk briefly about what happens if you do not take reasonable care. So for a registered tax practitioner that does not take reasonable care under items nine and 10 of the code, the TPV may find that they've breached the code and therefore may impose sanctions for that breach. If following an investigation, you find a tax practitioner has failed to comply, we may impose one or more of the following administrative sanctions. Maybe a written caution, maybe an order requiring you to do certain things, such as completing a course of education or training you specify, only providing certain services, so limiting the services you can provide, or requiring you to provide services only under supervision. It may be a suspension of your registration, or in worst case, it may be a termination of the registration. The severity of a sanction depends on the nature and extent of the breach and the individual circumstances of each case. So to finish up, I'd like to work through some real life case studies involving reasonable care. So this first case study looks at what happened to a tax agent who failed to take reasonable care in ascertaining a client's state of affairs and applied taxation laws incorrectly. This is a real example. The tax agent company was investigated by the TPB's Board Conduct Committee, the BCC, for suspected breaches of the code. The ATO referred the case after completing audits on income tax returns that the company prepared and lodged for 21 of its clients. As a result of the audits, the ATO disallowed work-related expenses because the relevant expenses were not adequately substantiated and or the clients did not demonstrate sufficient connection between the claims and the work-related activities. 
Subsequently, some of the taxpayers involved appealed the amended assessments to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, the AAT, for a review of the ATO's decision. In rejecting the appeals, the AAT also made findings that the company's conduct in claiming the deductions was reckless and demonstrated a lack of reasonable care in the preparation and lodgement of the relevant returns. So in considering the investigation, the BCC found the company had breached the code and that it failed to take reasonable care by failing to ask for sufficient or relevant questions regarding work-related expense deductions, failing to cite the necessary supporting documentation to a certain work-related expenses were actually incurred, and failing, failing to ensure the taxation laws were applied correctly to client circumstances, and failing to substantiate clients' work-related expense claims. The BCC also found that the company had failed to ensure that the tax agent services it provided or that were provided on its behalf were provided competently and the company's registration in this instance was terminated. So the next case study, we investigated the conduct of a tax agent and his company tax agent practice, which showed reckless, reckless behaviour, disregard for tax laws, failure to take reasonable care and a lack of honesty and integrity. The BCC terminated the individual and company registrations, imposing a five-year ban on the individual from applying for registration. The ATO had ordered 48 of the company's tax agents practice, showing that work-related expense claims and tax returns could not be substantiated or did not relate to assessable income. This resulted in the claims and rental deductions being disallowed disallowed or reduced with a total tax shortfall of over $317,000. The ATO also ordered one, ordered one of the agent's associated entities, disallowing unsubstantiated research and development, refundable tax offsets and imposing administrative penalties. The ATO had previously ordered work-related expense deductions associated with this agent, resulting in significant shortfalls and penalties. And despite the poor outcomes and a direction to undertake further education, the BCC noted that the agent's lack of remorse or contrition for its conduct indicated a distinct lack of respect for the tax system and client care. Client care. To comply with reasonable care obligations, in this case, the tax agent should have ensured their clients had spent the money themselves or incurred the cost and weren't reimbursed by their employer. Ensured the expense was directly related to earning their income and that they had a record to prove the expenses. So we asked tax practitioners to take extra care when preparing returns for your clients. Ask a few extra questions to ensure the money was spent, the connection is solid and a record exists. In this case, the company and the individual also failed to comply with their own personal tax obligations, failing to pay outstanding tax debts and to pay direct penalty notices relating to employer obligations. These debts totaled over $250,000 with no payment arrangements in place with the ATO. And as I say, these were terminated, both the individual and company registration. All right, I think we're up to questions. Uh, over to you, Julie. Yeah, definitely. I've got a few questions here for you. Um, so the first one that I've got here is, um, in the beginning of the webinar, you spoke about there not being a set formula to determine taking reasonable care. So if that's the case, how do um, tax practitioners determine that they're actually meeting their requirements? Okay, uh, well, ultimately, determining whether a tax practitioner has complied with their obligations under Code Items 9 and 10 will be a question of fact. Um, there, are, there are no set formulas. So this means each situation will need to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis in regard to the specific facts and circumstances. Uh, a good question to ask yourself is, what do you think your peers and colleagues would do in this particular circumstance or situation? And that may assist you in seeing where you sit as far as taking reasonable care. 
Excellent. Thank you for that, Craig. Uh, the next question that I have for you is um, what does reasonable care, sorry, what does taking reasonable care mean in relation to a statement that you make or a thing that you do for your client? Okay. Um, so a statement, a statement could be a statement, is a statement you make to the ATO or to your client when providing tax advice. And an example of this is a BAS, a BAS agent's declaration made when electronically submitting a BAS return. That would be a statement. So, um, a thing you do could include providing tax advice to your client or preparing and lodging return statements, objections or appeals on behalf of your client. And all of these things require reasonable care to be taken. Um, we should work through them for the client or for the tax department. Great, thank you for that. Um, also, you mentioned using an engagement letter to set out the scope um, of services to be done. Can you let us know, is it actually compulsory for tax practitioners to use an engagement letter? So no, it's not. Engagement letters are not a specific requirement under the code, but we do highly recommend you use them. Using an engagement letter can assist to establish a clear understanding of the elements of the engagement, that you're undertaking between yourself and your client. Um, there's a simple way to set out business practices practices you have in place to ensure your clients and you can comply or you can comply with your code obligations. They're a useful tool in helping you maintain an efficient, effective and ethical practice. Um, they set out the terms and scopes of the service you offer. Uh, and you know, they're, they're, they're extremely useful in avoiding uncertainty and misunderstandings, especially in relation to disputes over fees and the scope of work that was being completed. Excellent, thank you. I think that makes it really clear that it is an important um, thing to have in place with your clients. Um, so the next question that I have here is, um, We've got someone who wants to make sure that they're handling their work-related expense claims correctly. Uh, what are some of the things that they can do to make sure that they're um, taking care of it in the correct manner? Okay, thank you. Um, well, the first thing is keep in mind what the ATO Commissioner refers to as the golden rules of claiming work-related expenses. If you have a client who wants to claim them, you need to ensure that the client has spent the money themselves or incurred the cost and that it wasn't reimbursed by their employer. The expense has to be directly related to the earning of income by the client and the client has to have a record to prove those expenses. So what you need to do, you, you really need to talk to your client, ask them, did you spend the money? Did you get reimbursed? How does the expense relate to the earning of the income? Uh, was there a private component? to the expense that needs to be apportioned and do they have records to prove the expense? And, and if not, why not? Um, we also make, need to make clear to your client that they're not automatically entitled to claim standard deductions. Exceptions to keeping written evidence are there to make things simpler. For example, claiming $150 for laundry expenses or using the cents per kilometre method, method for car expenses, but the client still needs to show how they worked out their claims. Um, you also need to make sure the substantiation rules must be met. So they must have written evidence to prove claims uh, if it exceeds $300. Uh, and that must be for the total amount, not just the amount over the $300. You've got to remember which things apply in the $300 limit. So it doesn't apply to car expenses, um, meal allowances, award transport payments or other travel allowances um, and then probably moving on the written evidence they provide must include a document from the supplier of the goods or services so the name of the supplier the amount of expense the type of goods the date the expenses were incurred and another good step to take is that prior to lodging your clients tax returns make use of the ATO's pre-filling service you can use it to ensure work-related expense claims are correct and help prevent delays 
And the pre-filling service does include messages indicating whether clients had comparatively high deductions in previous years. This helps you identify whether their deductions require closer scrutiny. Um, probably, after all that, you can probably spend time on the ATO website looking at their views on the deductions and how you might claim them. Excellent. Thanks, Craig. There's a lot of good advice there. So um, as you said, the ATO's website does have more information. So we'll um, include a link to some of that as well, just so that um, you can go and have a look on there and clarify anything you need to as well. Um, so I've got another question here for you, Craig. And um, this one is, what if I tell a client I can't claim a work-related expense for them and they go to another tax agent? Should I report them? That's a good question. Um, so if you think your client's acting illegally in that respect, you actually do not have an obligation to notify the ATO. Um, and in fact, if you did, you may be breaching, sorry, you may be disclosing client information, which would be a breach of your confidentiality requirements, uh, which is an obligation on you under code item six. Um, Exceptions to this rule would be if you have a legal duty to disclose the information to the ATO. For example, if they'd issued a notice from the ATO requiring it. Um, it's, in this regard, it's also I also note that whistleblower provisions could mean you'll be protected in specific circumstances from sanctions. Um, probably at the more practical level, if you suspect your client is acting illegally, talk to the client about it. And if it doesn't resolve the issue. Uh, we certainly suggest you decline the engagement for that client because it'll only cause you problems down the track. Thanks, Craig. I've just got one more question for you today, and I guess it's in addition to the last one, um, and that is if I do tell a client that I can't claim a work-related expense for them and they do go to another tax agent, what should the tax practitioner do about the new agent? Can they report them in that situation? Yeah, so so certainly you may you may encounter that type of um, behaviour here of that type of behaviour which fails to meet the standards expected of tax practitioners, uh, and we certainly do encourage you in that instance to let us know um, about other practitioners who may not be um, maintaining the the level that we require in the code. Um, if you do, it's important to provide us with as much detail as possible. Um, and any relevant documentation you might have to support that complaint. Um, and you can certainly do that on our website. There's an online complaint form uh, on the TPV website. Um, and you can lodge a complaint anonymously, but it does limit our ability to deal with the complaint. Uh, and we take them all seriously and we look into them and we, we review them um, to make sure that we maintain the standards of the profession. Thanks, Craig. We'll also um, send out a link to that complaint form as well, just in case anyone does need to use that. Um, so I think that's all the questions that we had for today. So um, I've just got some more information now about staying in touch with us. So if you'd like more information and to keep up to date, as I said earlier, you can visit our website at tpv.gov.au. You can also follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter. And we also have a newsletter that goes out each month called TPV E-News, which you can subscribe to at our um, website also. The link for that one is tpv.gov.au forward slash newsroom. Uh, you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive notifications when we post new videos. And we do actually record all of our webinars and we've got a comprehensive library available for you to view them at your leisure. And the great news there is that you can still claim your CPE or CPD for viewing these videos. So that's really good. Um, I also just want to say a big thank you to Craig for sharing his insights today. And um, thank you to Madeline and Jazz for answering all the questions in the chat box. It's been great having you guys on board today. And I also wanted to say thank you to everyone in the audience for attending today. We do hope that you found the webinar beneficial. Uh, we think that the webinars are a really great way for everyone to keep up to date. And as I have said today, it does count towards your CPD and CPE. But just remember, we do not issue attendance certificates. We will email you with a notification that you have attended today and you can keep that as a record of attendance for today's session. Um, if you are interested in attending more webinars, please go to our website, tbb.gov.au forward slash webinars. 
And then one last thing today before we do finish up, I'll be launching an exit survey and we'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to complete it. It only takes a moment and we really do value your feedback. It um, helps us to improve on the webinars and also it's a great way for you to let us know if there's any topics that you're interested in hearing about as well. So please, um, yeah, if you can contribute to the survey, it'll just um, open up in your browser once you leave the webinar today. So thank you everyone once again for joining us. Please stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks all.